My name is Sergio Marrero. I'm managing director of Blue Ridge Labs uh, out of Brooklyn, New York. So we focus on supporting uh, early stage entrepreneurs that are fighting poverty. I have two very special guests and friends today. Uh, Aaron Walker, who is the founder and CEO of Camelback Ventures and also the Ruthless for Good Fund. Uh, and Ariel, uh, it's Burham Ziegler. I got her, uh, we go Ariel BZ. Uh, for short, but, uh, and she is a program lead uh, at Unleash, so we'll talk about uh, innovation models, uh, supporting early stage entrepreneurs, and, and hear about all the different approaches today, but how are you guys doing? Yeah, ready to, ready to roll? <laughs> awesome. So um, first we'll start with a quick introduction, so uh, Aaron, you want to kick it off with, of yourself? All right, sure. Can y'all hear me okay? All right, all right, there we go, there we go, okay. I'm not, I'm not ready to use my teacher voice this morning. Um, Aaron Walker, uh, founder and CEO of Camelback Ventures. I've been running uh, Camelback for the last nine years or so. Um, really, our mission is to try to increase uh, access and opportunity for uh, entrepreneurs of color and women by investing in their uh, companies, but also in their leadership. And in the last couple years, we have sort of taken on this work to really deal with um, like equity and fairness and funding, because it's, it's great to start all of these uh, amazing entrepreneurs and, and what they're doing, but the capital markets in many ways in my mind are still broke um, in terms of how money is being allocated to uh, those who I think have a comparative advantage. And so uh, we, we've been working on that. Uh, Sergio alluded to a, a fund that we're working on. I'm, I'm happy to talk about that, um, and as long as the SEC is not here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, and thanks for being here. Uh, I love starting my morning talking about innovation, and we always start our programming early because we are a global program, and we're typically representing 50 different countries at any given point in time. So I'm Ariel Berghammer Ziegler, and I'm the lead for the Unleash Plus Incubator Program. Uh, we operate under the broader Unleash Program umbrella, which is a platform and um, overall program to support youth mobilizing them to create change in their communities and launch solutions in line with the sustainable development goals set forth by the United Nations. And in our program in particular, we are a six-month incubator for early stage social impact ventures. So all of our teams from around the world are in some way aligned with the social impact cause in line with the sustainable development goals. At any given point in time, we've got 250 to 300 participants in our program from 50 different countries. So we bring them together under a global umbrella to collaborate, to network, and to really learn the skills, the tools, the resources, and access to global experts and mentors to support them in launching their solutions. And in my role in particular, I wear two hats. Uh, I come from Commonics International, which is a sustainable development firm that implements programs in over 100 different countries around the world. And we are Unleash's lead scale partner. So I, uh, on my day job normally, I'm really implementing and working with this incubator program. But then on Commonics, I'm a senior specialist for our innovation and investment office. Awesome. Thank you both for that. So what we'll do is we'll chat for about 20, 25 minutes, talk about the different different models. Uh, um, and it was definitely intentional. Blue Ridge Labs focuses on poverty in New York. Uh, and uh, Aaron, your organization focuses on the, the, the US. And then we have the global perspective and all early stage entrepreneurs with, with different approaches. So excited to dive in. Um, I wanted to first kick off with Ariel, if you can talk about what what is Unleash? What do you guys actually do? Thank you. Uh, so Unleash honestly is a lot of fun and I actually always start by saying that I started as a global talent who came through their regular programming in their second year. They started in 2017 and a few of us from our innovation team and our global programming joined uh, to really see what Unleash was all about after we heard a lot of really great things the first year. Um, and they started as a program that brings together a thousand youth from around the world um, in a really inclusive way. Everything is covered. It's a nonprofit organization based out of Denmark that really is trying to create the space to bring youth together together to network on the SDGs, to teach them about design thinking and creative problem solving, really to launch and figure out how to collaborate to solve the world's most intractable challenges. And so from that, uh, Commonics actually was so passionate about what they were doing and felt like there was such a strong mission alignment that we thought we could actually help implement a broader scale program. So we joined with Unleash in 2019 and helped co-create and co-design the Unleash Plus Incubator program to really help continue supporting those 
innovators and entrepreneurs that wanted to actually launch a solution and start a business. And so in our incubator program, it kind of creates as a feeder. You can come out of the regular Unleash programming, um, which now we have the Global Lab, which we're getting ready to launch India, uh, coming up one of our first in-person events again that uh, it's been a few years. We just did our first regional lab in Greenland that was really focused on the Arctic Circle and climate change and issues facing those regional um, countries all represented within that space. We also have localized hacks programming, so we also have ambassadors who then can launch and lead community-driven events in local languages, local countries, to really provide the skills and tools and resources at that local level for the issues that they're most passionate about solving and bringing in partners and mobilizing capital at that more localized level. And then for our program, we operate over six months in a couple of different phases. So you can either come through that pipeline um, through Unleash if you've already been part of one of our programs, or you can actually just apply as any entrepreneur that fits our core criteria, being youth between the ages of 18 and 35. It's a broad spectrum of youth. <laughs> Makes me feel not quite as old. Uh, and then in that program, we run them through a six-month iteration. We kick it off. There's a lot of intensity, a lot of global um, connectivity so that they're meeting people from around the world and really collaborating on their sustainability initiatives or their solutions. They get access to mentorship throughout the program, so experienced global mentors that are successful entrepreneurs or innovation leaders in their own right to help guide them and support them in the process. And then we have amazing experts like Sergio who join us uh, on a volunteer basis every year to really provide their technical expertise and their networks to help really launch and give them even more access to capital, to technical advice, to anything that might help set them on the right track. Yeah, I remember my when I first volunteered, I signed up and I was like, is this a real thing? And uh, I, I ended up facilitating in Singapore and it was like a hackathon. If everyone's been to a startup weekend, it's like a startup weekend, but over 10 days and it's 10, 10 days, 14 hours a day, people going from con, like concept to build. It's on, on, we have a thousand people. There's a lot of energy there. So really cool uh, from all around the world. Um, I uh, wanted to turn it back to uh, Aaron, if you could share a little bit about um, your your experience and uh, insight on on what you know what is what is Camelback Ventures, and yeah. then also what is Ruthless for Good. Yeah, definitely. Um, so let's back up a couple a couple beats because I think <laughs> it'll it'll give some context to help understand uh, what what Camelback is. Um, Camelback is the third company I've started. Uh, the, the first two have come and gone. You probably don't know the name of them uh, for, for good reason. And the, re the reason I start there is because oftentimes, you know, the story is like you just sort of woke up and you had this great idea and everything worked out. Uh, that's often not the case, particularly in entrepreneurship. Uh, and in many ways, Camelback is like the thing that I wish had existed when I was working on my first two companies. Uh, you know, like... I had, you know, gone to quote unquote prestigious universities and jobs and all these other things, and then I sort of step out into the into the world with this idea, and um, it's like really hard in a way that I wasn't expecting, and I'm like, oh, like now that now that I don't sort of have an institution or like a white guy behind me, and that's just me, uh, you know, people's excitement and engagement looks really different, um, and so trying to figure out like what 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 to do with that. Uh, and I thought to myself, like, you know, um, could I create a business that would help other folks who were like me and folks that I was meeting who were sort of telling the same story of having lack of access to what we at Camelback call it the three C's, uh, coaching, connections, and capital. And so that, that was really like the, the impetus for the organization, which is can we write early stage checks to uh, entrepreneurs who oftentimes don't come for money? Um, don't have access to uh, financial resources in the, in the same way. So when we think about the racial wealth gap, I mean, to me, that's one of the byproducts of it is that um, there are certain segments of folks who don't have $50,000 who just like put into a company to see if it works or don't have an uncle or a friend to be like, hey, here's $20,000, go take a cut out. If you give it, if you give me my money back, great. But if not, don't worry, I'll just tease you at the barbecue for the next 20 years. Uh, and so that, that was the capital piece. And then, you know, I think Ariel sort of alluded to some of the other pieces uh, around, you know, connections, like, you know, how do you build that social, social capital? Um, and so I think about, you know, part of, part of the Camelback journey is that there were people who got me into rooms that I didn't know even existed. 
And those rooms are really where the deal making happens. And so how can we begin to leverage our social capital to help entrepreneurs uh, sort of sort of be in the room where it happens, as, as they say in the musical. Uh, and then the, the last piece is just the coaching, which is I think leadership looks different. Um, and leadership can show up in many different ways. And, uh, you know, I think we have an archetype of what a quote unquote leader looks like, but um, that's just one archetype. And I think there, there are many others. And so what we try to do is just like, honor the different ways that people and leaders show up um, and then just so, sort of support them in their own version of, of, what, that, of what that looks like. And so uh, what does that mean specifically in, in our work? Uh, we run an accelerator program. It is four months. We write $40,000 checks to all the founders, sort of this friends and family for people who don't have it. Um, you know, we use our social network to connect them to you know, mentors and board members and coaches and customers. Um, and we have like a whole coach, coaching module that we, that we implement with them. So we've been doing that. We, uh, for this year is the first year we're, we do it in a cohort-based model. So uh, this year is the first time we're doing two cohorts. So historically, we've been doing one, but this year we, we're doing two. Uh, the, the other piece of the work is we started something a couple years ago called the Capital Collaborative. Um, Apparently at Camelback, we like C's. <laughs> uh, and really, it was this idea. When we looked at our portfolio, what we saw essentially was that Camelback fellows were outperforming their peers coming out of other accelerators. Uh, they were, had more revenue 12 months after the program was over. Their impact metrics, um, to the extent that they were measuring them, were better. Uh, but they were still getting out raised three to one. And I wasn't surprised by that, but it was like deeply sobering. And oftentimes you have the conversation that's like, well, you know, maybe they don't have this, maybe they don't have that. And it's like, well, here's a six-year data set to say this is nothing about traction. So either that means that, you know, sophisticated investors um, are not as sophisticated as we think, or that there's really, uh, there's some deep bias in the system. Um, I think they're too smart for the former. So I have, I have assumed the latter uh, until further notice. But it's just like, well, then what, what do we do with that? Um, and so for us, you know, part of our system change work is we started uh, this program strictly for and specifically for uh, resource allocators and philanthropy and, um, and impact investing to say, hey, you know, like when we look at an entrepreneurial ecosystem, entrepreneurs are just one piece of the puzzle but that you know, oftentimes the folks who, who set the conditions are the resource allocators. And uh, you know, if, we're, if we're going to get to a more equitable and enlightened place, that we need to do work with, with um, those philanthropists, those investors as well. And so we've been doing that over the last couple of years. And really our goal, uh, quite frankly, is just to uh, move more money to women in, and, and folks of color who, who are building companies and organizations in this space. And so, you know, we've been able to make some small change in the last couple of years. So the, we work with about 60 uh, philanthropists and impact investors, everyone from uh, institutions like Blue Meridian and MacArthur Foundation and Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, and we're starting to see, see that progress where they have increased uh, their deal count to, to those populations by 13% so far, but that's to me, drop in the bucket, so we still have ways to go on that. Um, so that, that's all the Camelback stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, and on Camelback, before I ask, ask you about Ruthless for yeah. Good, I remember um, you had a demo day in San Francisco. I was training a group of investors, brought them in there. Um, I, you know, because you're supporting nonprofits and for profits, very yeah. purpose driven, talking about equity. This was before George Floyd and before we started actually talking in the mainstream yeah. about racial equity. Uh, and um, I, I tricked some of them into going. <laughs> uh, it was great uh, in terms of exposure, but but a very powerful event, very moving uh, hearing the, the different founders that, um, you know, got that early stage yeah. support that needed it. So, so definitely appreciate that. Uh, and I want uh, you know to to give light to the the fund that yep. is that is starting yep. uh, ruthless for good fund. So yep. the the next extension, if you yep. want to share about that. Yeah, definitely. So I mean, I think this data point that I that I articulate around this three to one piece uh, it sort of led us down two roads. One was this work mm -hmm. with uh, resource allocators uh, that you know we call the capital collaborative. The other piece was. Uh, 
like we should just start a fund ourselves. Like why are we sitting here begging everyone else to do the right thing <laughs> when uh, we could create a vehicle to um, you know help those entrepreneurs and catch some upside ourselves. And so as a nonprofit, you're always, you know, you're constantly asked, particularly, you know, at this stage when we're you know, almost 10 years old, well, what's your sustainability plan? What's your sustainability plan? Um, and we thought to ourselves, well, we, you know, uh, you know, in 2020, we raised more money than we had ever raised before. Uh, and so we said, well, what are we going to do with all this cash? And one of the thoughts that we had uh, that sort of met a lot of the different things we were trying to achieve as well, Camelback should just be the sponsor uh, and first investor in, in a fund. And so we did it. We just said, we just said, well, it's our money. We don't have to ask for permission. Uh, and so we put the first $2 million in. Um, you know, we're 18 million in on a $30 million raise, so we still have some ways to go. But the idea is to invest in education, the future of work in a category that is really a catch-all, but we're calling it access innovation, which uh, is just a bunch of fancy words to say. We want to invest in companies that are trying to increase access for communities that have been historically denied access. So we're in particular looking at things like uh, FinTech and inclusive health as, as two starting points for that. So in many ways, it's an extension of the industries and sort of sectors that Camelback is investing in, but it gives us a new vehicle um, to be able to make really significant investments. So $40,000 checks are great, um, but you know, in this fund, we're able to write you know, 250 to, to 800K checks and um, really begin, begin to sort of you know, help those entrepreneurs who quite frankly need it and have earned the investment. So this is, to me, it's not, it's not about charity. These are, just great, these are just great investments. And because Camelback is an LP in the fund, it gives us an opportunity that if this fund is wildly successful, that one day we may not have to ask anyone for money. That's, that's it, that you invest for good and it comes back. So great. Thank you. And Sergio, can you maybe speak to that a little bit, your new work with Blue Ridge Labs? What is unique about it? What are you doing in New York City? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, just to give a little context of Blue Ridge Labs itself, we are an uh, innovation unit of the Robin Hood Foundation. A lot of people know it. If you're, you're focused on New York, they're deploying $140 million a year into nonprofits uh, across New York that are, that are fighting and, and aim to end, end poverty. And we're the small uh, in incubation unit that... Um, we test and, and help launch, uh, accelerate, and invest in these early stage founders that are aligned with that, that there may not be the evidence that uh, philanthropy usually needs to back these early stage founders. So example, and um, I'll, I'll tie this back actually to, to uh, everyone, is, is when I first met Aaron, I was, I was myself a founder working on a, it was like a text-based solution to, to prevent dropouts. At the time, this was you know nine, eight, you know, so was more than ten years ago. <laughs> they uh, it, it, philanthropy was saying t SMS to help stop people dropping out of college. Where's the evidence for that? Um, I ended up in Blue Ridge Labs uh, as a as a founder. Uh, so and um, you know working on these solutions and that those are the types of entrepreneurs they support. They're like this sounds like it makes sense. This founder knows you know there's an expertise here, but we don't quite have the evidence yet to back them. And so we, um, you know, we, we uh, support those early stage entrepreneurs. Uh, and then you talked about what, what's unique about it. Uh, every entrepreneur that engages with our program, we have a community of uh, over 1,500 low income New Yorkers that every, um, in the fellowship, they, they will do user research with them. So they are building with uh, and, and I haven't seen uh, any programs do quite the same thing where they're going out into the community, they're interviewing people on their issues with paying phone bills, their uh, low income housing, access to, um, you know, like uh, access to credit uh, for dealing with, um, you know, uh, go, the, the issues of get, finding a job after you've come out of jail, right? So, so dealing with real issues and developing solutions with the community you're trying to serve. So that's a little bit about the work that we do. Uh, so thanks for asking. Yeah, Thank you. It. Um, I want to switch it, uh, switch gears um, as well. Um, and Ariel, if you can, I'm going to switch it up. Uh, if you could share a little bit more uh, about um, some of the founders that, that you've been working with. I understand one of them's here. Um, if you can uh, share share more about like the early stage work you guys did with them and, and where they are now. Absolutely. And I think your point about community is so poignant and you talking about kind of that cohort model because I think for us, especially in that early stage space, 
I think especially anybody who's been a founder, you know it can be really lonely or you're setting out a path on your own and really trying to navigate and what happens past that idea, what happens as you make it through each step. And I think for us, Unleash is all about creating that community and that support and global network to you know, stay with you. So even if you're done with our six month program, you stay part of that community. You can still tap back into the mentorship, the access to the experts, to other entrepreneurs and innovators around the world. You constantly see people on our global community saying, hey, I need a tech developer who can give me a little bit of time or a graphic designer. And it's pretty phenomenal to see that, you know, people are so moved by the community and their experiences that they're willing to give back that time. They want to stay invested and connected. Um, and so your, your point about Mike, I don't think he's actually here, but really want to call out one of our um, phenomenal teams that came through our original cohort in 2019 is uh, they originally were Akari. Um, and Mike Mitchell is one of the SOCAP entrepreneurs here uh, today and is featured. I hope you get a chance to actually check out some of his work. Um, but they started looking at a sustainability problem with an invasive species coming out of South America. And originally we're looking at jerky. Um, they established a, a fish jerky concept to look at overfishing an intentional overfishing of this invasive species and really looking at kind of a holistic supply chain um, around selling this product. And they came through our program in 2019. They were one of the awardees that won and um, have you know, actually pivoted, um, but they took all of the skills and the tools and that connection to the community and now are actually transformed into Pezzy Pets. And shameless plug for them, their pet traits are actually awesome. My, my dog loves them, they're his favorite <laughs> treat. Um, but it's really phenomenal to see that in our program, you know, for them, part of coming to the program was that that actually was not working. Like the product market fit wasn't there, but they were then able to really pivot and adapt and now are having quite a bit of success. And then tapping into those networks leads to access to other opportunities and you can build on that. And I think one of the best examples that we have and, and really where Comonix is trying to stay committed to that longer term support is a group out of Tanzania called Navfeed. Um, phenomenal female founder who's a microbiologist by trade turned entrepreneur who is launching, well she's created and found actually these micro, I am not a microbiologist, but she has created new forms of organic waste transformation into sustainable fish feed that has like a higher protein content than anything else on the market. It's revolutionary. She has now created and formed two different forms of bacteria that previously did not exist in science in Dar Salim. And arguably, without these global programs, she might have just continued to do her, her scientific research in a lab, but instead, through these networks, they're now scaling and launching their products out of Tanzania, and we're looking at opportunities for them to make that jump, and they're now engaged in programming across Africa, and Comonix actually <coughs> awarded that team um, as one of our awardees. So we support us a program partner, we help run the incubator program, but then on the other end, we also create usually a, somewhere between five and $25,000 awards for teams that we really believe have potential to scale or fit within some of our core priorities in the organization. And then we provide them continuous ongoing support, uh, mentorship access, so that way as they you know, kind of come out and are really trying to launch and scale, they have a little bit of that community and that buffer that's a bit more intentional, as well as some of that seed funding. And when Navfeed came out, they were looking for literally $5,000 to just help get their equipment off the ground. They had done all of their testing, all of their research, backed in the lab, everything that they needed, but they could not get access to the $5,000 that they needed just to get the equipment to actually start producing the fish feed pellets. And to most of us sitting in this room, $5,000, like you could probably go find that from somebody in the next five minutes if you really needed it. You might have friends or family, like Aaron mentioned, that you can tap into, maybe. But for those that don't have that access, who can't just reach into their pocket and bootstrap $5,000 in you know, maybe a couple of weeks, they don't have people to tap into that's preventing them from entering that market, no matter how phenomenal their innovation is, no matter what their business model could be or the impact it could create. So for us in Unleash, and especially through Comonix work, and as we increasingly look at the investment side, we're really looking to continue to support and fuel um, more support to these types of entrepreneurs that have the potential to really scale massive change. And you're, that's great. I remember going and, and speaking with the team and being amazed at, uh, what is it, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say my, my bias of being in the U.S. saying, oh, the, all the innovation is here and it's going out and that's not true, right? That we just don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Unleash building those pipelines mm -hmm. that, are, that are so important. Your model specifically is, is global. What elements of what you're doing uh, do you think are, are unique to supporting this global entrepreneur 
network that, that you're building. Thank you. And I think, you know, anybody who works in the, the innovation space, you probably are familiar with a bunch of different labs. There are a lot of phenomenal local ecosystems out there. So by no means do I think or propose that we are the only ones doing what we're doing. We're absolutely not. But I think we really try to mobilize partnerships and we look to find ways to elevate and collaborate with those local ecosystems rather than replace or silo. And so I think for us, every time we're going into a new area or even the hacks that I mentioned, um, where entrepreneurs or social you know, change makers are really empowered to also take our methodology and really take that forward. Um, they can also tap into those local ecosystems, I think, in a different way where it's bringing people together. So instead of competing for resources or competing for um, support or visibility, it's more enabling and empowering that local ecosystem, which hopefully directs that capital or the resourcing and funding in a way that's more effective or efficient for change. Um, but I think also the global nature of our program is part of what is so unique. Because in any cohort, as I mentioned, we may have 40 to 50 different countries represented at one time. So an average Saturday for me is, you know, 200 young people from around the world all on one call together, collaborating, working together, meeting with mentors from something like Camelback Ventures, but also somebody based out of Singapore's Innovation Lab in one of their universities, or from Costa Rica working at Deloitte on the future of health tech. I mean, that's just like a small microcosm of an example, but what you can get by bringing all of these folks together, and especially in a virtual space, um, in some ways the pandemic has enabled this to a whole other level because we can actually facilitate that on a weekly or daily basis for them to share that knowledge, for them to share those connections and the networks. And I think one of the other really important pieces that we have come to see over time is that there's something powerful albeit perhaps structurally wrong, that comes with the credibility of being part of a global program. Mm -hmm. And so when these entrepreneurs maybe stand alone in Dar Salim or in rural Mexico and they're seeking to access capital or get that support for financing or even access alone, alone they may be denied. Alone they may not be recognized as someone that is going to be uh, trustworthy enough for a loan. They may not even has, have access. They're too high of a risk. But all of a sudden, you put them in our global program, and we have global recognition and a brand surrounding it. Or like for our teams that come through Chemonix, we've had multiple of our teams tell us it was our connection to Unleash and then the support from Chemonix that got us access to finance. Because to those, you know, to Aaron's point, that have the resource allocation ability, they look at that and they say, OK, maybe this isn't as risky. We're willing to take a chance. Whereas maybe three years ago, if it was the team standing alone, they wouldn't do that. So I think that for all of us, we have a responsibility to really think about how do we push for a paradigm shift and make that change and recognizing that innovation and the potential for scaled impact can happen locally and it can be community driven, like you were saying, Sergio, in New York, um, but also how can we continue to support and enable programs like this that are also helping them um, throughout that way and really enabling that ecosystem to support them. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, you, uh, I know you just mentioned a few companies that have benefited. I wanted to give Aaron, if you want to share uh, an example of, of a company that has benefited from, from your program in, in launching. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I appreciate you sharing, sharing that area a lot. What you said resonates. Um, well, I'm, I'm thinking in particular, sorry, this, this thing is like jingling. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, we have, that we have in common uh, called Wiggle Room. Uh, they're a New York City-based uh, company started by uh, a woman named Jamie Jen Lewis. She is in the early childhood space and really ha had this idea for w what would it look like to create a marketplace where uh, parents who work non-traditional jobs could find childcare. And this market in particular was intriguing to me because uh, I'm a parent. I understand the pain of trying to find childcare, uh, and in many, but but in many ways, I don't work a non-traditional job. Like, uh, you know, I, I don't work in the retail sector where I'm subject to dynamic scheduling, and I don't know what day I'm going to be working every week until th that week. And so, if you're trying to find childcare, what 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 do you do? And um, one of the things I didn't know that I learned from, from Jamie Jen is that almost, almost half the children growing up in this country, the people who are their caretakers or their parents or their guardians, um, they work non-traditional jobs. And so, you know, when we started thinking about, you know, the future of this country, like half the children, their parents or whoever's taking care of them are trying to figure out 
you know, what to do with them every day, how can they have a, an enriching uh, and loving experience, um, and quite frankly, the most formative uh, period of their life. And so Jamie's, Jamie Jen's idea was to uh, create a marketplace where these parents could find childcare, uh, particularly in, in home-based uh, uh, childcare centers. So in cities like New York, you know, I lived in Brooklyn for, uh, for several years. We sent our kids when they were born to um, a, a, like a home-based daycare right across the street from, from where we lived. And, you know, it was great. And oftentimes those businesses are run by, uh, you know, women of color. And they're small businesses, and they are the last to pay themselves because that's a really hard business to run. And so her thought was, hey, well, if I could create a marketplace where on the one hand, I can help these parents find the child care that they need, and on the other hand, we can help essentially these small businesses that are oftentimes under capacity find more capacity to run a better business, then it's a win-win. You have parents who are getting the child care that they need. You're having these small businesses be at capacity so that... Uh, the, often the women who are running these businesses, maybe they will never become, you know, obscenely wealthy, but they will be able to make, you know, fifty, seventy-five, ninety thousand dollars a year, as opposed to poverty wages because they're just not at the capacity to, um, you know, when they pay themselves last, there's not that much left. And so, Jamie Jin went through Blue Ridge Labs, and then got connected to Camelback and went through our program and then um, has been one of the first investments. We made a couple investments in this fund. Um, one of the first investments that we made in the, in the Ruthless for Good Fund, and I know we're also uh, um, investing together on that, Sergio. So that's like one great example to me of sort of, you know, an entrepreneur who was able to sort of go from Blue Ridge to Camelback to our fund. And then I know that um, there's some other fun work going on at, at, at Robinhood as well. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. that. Yeah, she was able to, in the beginning, she didn't have a concept, came into the fellowship, went through the process of interviewing a, a, a lot of uh, low-income New Yorkers, and then also she brought a, a, a tremendous amount of uh, experience, launched the concept, and then, um, you know, later ended up getting that, that seed funding she needed. Uh, and then it's come full circle. Now we're investing uh, in a you know, for-profit impact company in, in a later round. So it takes an ecosystem of, of different programs to really get these uh, uh, early stage entrepreneurs to be successful to launch and, and get to the next steps. Um, and uh, I'll, uh, there's so many, so many entrepreneurs. Um, I'll, uh, there's, there's one, um, one I wanted to mention uh, from, from our program that uh, just it's like we're hoping Jamie Jin uh, is 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 in this vein as as well. But uh, um, you know we have all different uh, types of entrepreneurs in the Blue Ridge Labs program, nonprofit and for profit. One of the newest um, is called Unlock Labs. And when when the founding team was going through the Catalyst program, the co-founder was uh, in in jail, like actually incarcerated, and they were building an educational program to train folks in jail to have, uh, to have tech skills. And you might say, okay, like, so what? Like, give them computers or, you know, they're not allowed access to that. They had to create, like, almost an instance of the Internet <laughs> it, it, behind the firewalls so that they can test and learn. Mm -hmm. And some of them are coming out getting jobs that are paying, you know, uh, uh, you know talk about 50K plus, which, you know, for, for them, that's exactly what they need. That's the challenge of coming out of you know, you come out of uh, uh, jail and then you can't get a job because you've had a record. Like, you, you, even though you've served you, and paid your time, you're, you're still, um, you know, suffering and, and can't integrate into society. So, so they're doing great work uh, and, uh, and, and they're early days right now working with a few. And on the, the for-profit end, still in PAC, uh, we had a, a student uh, or a graduate of, of Stanford University come out, do a fellowship program. Um, he uh, was, you know, interested in, in creating an impact organization and wasn't sure what, what to build um, first, you know, and, and then focused on um, EBT, electronic uh, benefit transfer, um, and ended up saying, uh, interviewing folks and understanding that it was very difficult to use, uh, you know, your, your, your benefits to buy food uh, and created what is now Propel. 
uh, and they've gotten over $50 million in funding from the likes of Kleiner Perkins and Andreessen Horowitz, uh, and they started out, you know, of, of the, the lab. So it's where we're super excited and proud of, of uh, the entrepreneurs that come through. Um, but, uh, but enough about us. We appreciate you coming here and listening. Uh, now we're going to want to open it up and uh, la uh, use the last few minutes for questions. You know, I, I think that there is, like, one of the things that I have started to think about more and more in my work at Camelback is, like, the impact of uh, what, what, what a black woman, her name is Chloe McKenzie, she's a researcher, calls financial trauma. Um, and, you know, how that impacts, you know, people, you know, but particularly, you know, women and folks of color who have like a, a really sort of sorted engagement with the financial system, you know, and I use that in the, in the broadest terms. And how does that begin to manifest itself in how you think about fundraising, uh, how you think about paying yourself or not paying yourself, how you think about paying other people. And so I don't know if I have the complete answer to that, but I think it's something that I'm thinking more and more about as we work with entrepreneurs on fundraising, as we work with entrepreneurs on financial issues, is to say like, yes, we can sort of, you know, teach the stuff. But I think we also have a responsibility to really think about what sort of impact financial trauma has had on those folks and how do we build, uh, how do we build learning into that so that it can be a, a place of, of healing in some ways because, um, uh, like I, I think it's necessary for people to really figure out like wh what do they want to do and how they want to engage in the system. So that's like a one one thought. The other is I think there are other models out there. Obviously, you know we talk a lot about VC and and all that, and that's really a small percentage of like fundraising. Mm -hmm. You know there are uh, firms that you know are engaged in revenue based finance. Um, obviously, there's sort of traditional banks who are doing certain things that are CFI, CDFI. So you know. Um, like VC is great, but it's really a, a small, small percentage of the funding market, even though it takes up an outsized space in our in our in our dialogue. I think. Oh, go ahead. Good. Um, I think this is a really important topic, and I think well. I've seen, at least in the years that I've been working in this space, at least some progress and more attention being paid. I think for us, we really talk about intentional inclusion, and if you're not being intentional, and if you're not actually making it a point to focus on you know, what, and any aspect of diversity and inclusion, it's, you're really leaving it to chance. And so I think, you know, even on the Unleash side, our entire program really operates on a diversity and inclusion and equity model globally. And it's a huge part of our core. But what we still see globally is women being left behind, whether you are even here in the U.S. or Tanzania or Singapore. It doesn't even matter what market you're in. Women are still being left behind. And so we are actually in the process of co-designing with our women founders that have come through our program and are currently in our program a next iteration or an additional program for how can we better support. And we're really trying to actually employ our own innovation methodology to work with our users, as, as Sergio was explaining, Blue Ridge Labs does, and using the community. What are their experiences, the barriers, the obstacles? What are the challenges that they're facing, whether they're early stage or those that are looking to scale? Or maybe they've received, as you are saying, that maybe initial access to capital. Maybe they've made it even five years in, but where do they go from there, and where are they hitting those ceilings? And then how can we iteratively design programs and support, at least within our scope and space, um, and then working with other partners in the community to really elevate these issues and be very intentional about how can we better support. No one single um, investor or partner or organization is going to be able to solve this, but I think we really do feel like by being intentional, at least raising this and letting people know this is not a check the box. We didn't, you know, we, we've made progress in the last few years, so like we've solved this issue. There is a long way to go. And I would also really stress that part of the conversation needs to continue to be, to Aaron's earlier point, this is good business. These aren't just um, organizations and founders that, it's, you know, looks good. We're supporting because it has a nice social impact. There is a commercial um, element to this. It's good business. It's good for the economy. Those are good solutions, and there are markets out there um, for these businesses. And so if we can create that space and enable um, access to capital and access to the resources that people need at every stage, I think we're going to see a benefit globally um, yeah. throughout the economy. Can I, can I add one more thing? Sorry, you just reminded me of like two other things. One, so one <laughs> is, um, to that point, uh, 
you know, there, there's a, a journal, he's an economic journalist, his name is Jim Tankersley. He wrote a book called The Riches of This Land uh, a couple years ago. And uh, in the book, he talks about a lot of different things, but there was a, sort of a, an academic study looking at what the, the economic growth since 1960, what can we attribute it to? And, and what they found was that 40% of the economic growth since 1960 we can attribute to having more inclusion um, across race and uh, gender in uh, the workforce. Right? So to me, then, like what, what, the way I translate that in my mind is, well, what would it look like in the entrepreneurial space if we could be more inclusive across race and gender? Could we have 40% more impact than we're having right now? Could we have 40% more uh, you know, uh, economic equity than, than we're having right now? So that, that's one. And then two, um, you know, uh, the, the young lady who just asked the question uh, around fundraising. I also want to say like, that there's work to be done by resource allocators, you know? So oftentimes it's like, it's like you feel like crap as an entrepreneur because it's like not translating. And one of the things that, you know, we've learned in the Capital Collaborative, at, you know, in, in our funder work is that sometimes it's just like the, the, the structures weren't set up for you to, to succeed anyway. So one of the things that we talk about in, our, in the program is, and this is, you know, some research that we found, so we can't take credit for it, but, you know, oftentimes women get asked what uh, the report calls a prevention question. How are you going to make sure that this bad thing doesn't happen? How are you going to make sure that this bad thing doesn't happen? And that men get asked promotion questions. Tell me how awesome this is going to be. How big do you think the market's going to be? And so then if you're sitting there in an investment committee and you have, you know, uh, you're looking at two companies, say one is started by, um, you know, someone who is a woman or non-binary and you're looking at someone who is a man and, and all your notes for the dude are like, this is, you know, how great it could be, what the potential is, and then all your notes for the other one is how they're going to prevent all the bad things from happening, which one are you going to probably choose? <laughs> um, so I, I, say, I say all that to say um, that I, I didn't want to sort of leave this conversation sort of saying that the onus is only on the entrepreneur because I do think that there, are, there is an important onus on investors to sort of look at how they're approaching uh, uh, entrepreneurs and even just sort of using this example of the questions that they're asking um, and, and, and how something small like that that maybe you don't think is making a difference is actually making a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We'll take one more question, then we have to close it out. The fund is a, a barely a year old, so we um, we look at all the, the companies that go through Camel, but the fund does look, look at all the companies that go through Camelback. Um, we've invested in, we've made seven investments. Uh, two and probably a third before the end of the year will be from Camelback. Um, but we're not limited to just investing in the Camelback pipeline. Uh, you know, obviously the accelerator serves as a really great pipeline and kind of, um, you know, place for the fund to find great opportunities. But, you know, one of the things that we saw even before we had the fund is just that um, there were entrepreneurs who would come to us and we were like, you're an awesome entrepreneur. This is an amazing idea or, or company. You don't need to be in another program. Uh, but I, the only way I can write you a check is if you sit through this program. Um, and so we had to say no, or maybe they said, oh, it's not the best fit. And I had to respect, like, it, it totally made sense to me. And so I'm actually excited because now we have the opportunity as opposed to just sending someone a rejection letter and saying, you're too late. Uh, <laughs> uh, we can say, hey, we have, uh, you know, we have like a sister organization that, uh, you know, is making pre-seed and seed type investments. Go talk to them and, you know, maybe it's a yes, um, but at least, at least there's an opportunity there. Yeah, that's exactly what's happening at Blue Ridge Labs. We have the Catalyst program that their people are applying to. We're helping them, and, and they're finding product market fit. We're giving them money. And then there are these companies that are just further along mm -hmm. that aren't a fit but a great investment. So, you know, shameless plug, to, if you're an investor, impact investor looking for for-profit investments, tap these impact programs. There are for-profit companies that are doing great things. So can hit check multiple boxes.